I guess I first learned about it from C.W. Scott. I was the new pastor at Bruceville Baptist Church in Bruceville, Texas, and C.W. was an old-timer in that church, and he wanted to drive me around and show me the town. This is Bruceville, Texas. I thought I had seen all there was to see of Bruceville, Texas, but there was more than met the eye. And so I climbed in his car, and he began to drive me around town. He showed me where church members lived. He showed me where the general store used to be and where the barber shop used to be. He said, Preston, we always talk about the beauty shops as being the places of gossip. But he said, I heard more gossip in that barber shop than I ever heard around any group of any women. Finally, he drove me to the railroad tracks. And there at the railroad tracks, he parked the car and turned off the ignition. Uh-oh. Preston, he said, we used to be quite the town. He said, my daddy told me that there used to be a string of businesses right here, and he pointed to an open field that lined the railroad tracks. He said, there used to be all sorts of businesses right here on the railroad tracks. When the railroad came through the town, it brought business into the area. It helped the local farmers ship their grain. There were all sorts of small manufacturers and small businesses that sprung up right there by the railroad tracks. But since that's where the businesses and the manufacturers were, and since hobos and travelers frequented the railroad tracks, nobody really wanted to live right there by the tracks. He said, so only the poorest of folks lived right there by the tracks, and the poorest of the poor lived on the other side of the tracks. That's where we get the phrase, you're from the wrong side of the tracks. He said, my daddy was born on the other side of the tracks. And he said his family lived on the other side of the tracks. And he said for most of his life, there was at least one family in town that would not go to his parents' house because they lived on the wrong side of the tracks. He said all this changed when the interstate came through. It changed the whole railroad dynamic. And they had to tear down the businesses and manufacturers to make room for the interstate. But for a while, the history of this town was determined by those railroad tracks. And I guess since I spent a great deal of time in an old railroad town, I've always paid attention to the tracks. And I've always thought about that phrase, the wrong side of the tracks. In those days when railroads were opening up the West in our country, they were crisscrossing the nation. I'm sure Bruceville's story could have been told a thousand times over. The railroad tracks had a way of dividing a town in two. You can see those tracks even when they're no longer railroad tracks, like an interstate. An interstate can divide a city in two, can't it? If you're on I-35 headed south through Waco, Texas, you can look to the left at the most prestigious Baptist university in the world, its spires reaching to the heavens, glorious campus. And look to your right and see downtown Waco, which when I was there at least was the 16th poorest town in the United States per capita. Left from the interstate, right from the interstate. Sometimes it's a natural boundary like a river or a lake. Sometimes it's a state or a national border. Life is like this on one side of the line and life is like this on the other side of the line. Sometimes you can't even see the lines. They're more about race lines or political lines or religious lines or socioeconomic lines, but I guess that's what we're talking about today. Boundaries and borders, the tracks, that which separates us from them, that which keeps us us and them them, the right side of the tracks and the wrong side of the tracks. They came to the other side of the sea. That's how our story for today begins. They came to the other side of the sea. It's easy to skip over that, but that's the Bible's way of saying they crossed over to the wrong side of the tracks. Jesus was a Jew, his followers were Jews, but the people who lived on the other side of the sea, a.k.a. the Sea of Galilee, were not Jewish. And Jews didn't do these sorts of things in those days. And yet our text begins, they came to the other side of the sea. 
Crossing the sea was quite the experience. There was a huge storm on the Sea of Galilee. It wasn't uncommon. Great winds, huge waves. It was more difficult for them to cross the sea than it was for you to get here this morning. Hard time. It would have been easy for them to turn around, but they crossed to the other side of the sea. And no sooner did Jesus step out of the boat than He was approached by a man with an unclean spirit. The man lived in an unclean place, a a cemetery out by the caves and the tombs outside of town. He was there because those seemed to be the only people who could put up with him, the dead. All day and all night he screamed his way through it, screamed his way through life, cut himself with stones. Now the people had tried to bind him with chains, but that's not really what it says. In the original language it says the people tried to tame him with chains. It's the language of the zoo. They saw this man as a wild animal. And you just can't have a wild animal running loose in your community. People who have lost their minds are a threat to the way things are. They're a threat to the status quo. You can't have this man in town. So they banished him to the tombs and they tried to subdue him by shackling his wrists and ankles. They tried to control him by force. Today, I'm sure he would end up in some sort of institution. But shackles and chains aren't much good when the problem is of a spiritual nature. You can't address with physical force what troubles the soul. And so none of their force did much good. None of their force proved to be any help to this man. And the unclean spirit seemed to want to ruin the man, to harm himself. The unclean spirit caused him to to gash himself and cut himself with stones. Now let's be honest. In the West, given our post-enlightenment emphasis on reason, we're a little uncomfortable or a lot uncomfortable with all this talk of unclean spirits. I think for most of us, somewhere deep inside of us, we wish Mark would have given us some sort of medical or psychological diagnosis of this man. Somewhere deep inside of us, we would be much more uncomfortable if Mark brought a doctor in and said, the real problem with this man is... We're more comfortable with that kind of talk because once we begin to diagnose a problem, we can control it. We can get our mind around it. I think we're uncomfortable with this way of telling stories because none of us like to admit that there are forces in this world outside of our control. And yet, no matter what you call these forces, I think we've all observed times when someone went through something that was outside of their control. Maybe you've gone through something that was outside of your control. It's here even our language betrays us. I don't know what came over him. I I don't know what got into her. The young man passes out on his couch, five empty beer bottles there on the table by his couch. His parents begged him to quit. His boss commanded him to quit. His wife screamed at him for not quitting. And he tried. It's not that he didn't try. He tried. He just couldn't do it. And now there is no one left in his life telling him to stop. He ran them all off. A young woman in some sort of emotional distress often sends her over the edge. What for some people is a minor inconvenience for her is a life-changing, world-altering catastrophe. And on those lonely nights when the dark cloud dwells the darkest right above her head, she often thinks about going into the drawer where the prescription meds are She thinks about it. She's never done it, but she thinks about it. You can see from the depths of people's souls to the systems, the social structures we inhabit, that there are powers in this world that hold sway over us all. And breaking their power demands a power of a different sort. Notice in this text, the man's identity is absorbed by this this power. Notice that the man is never named... He doesn't have a name. Notice that the pronouns jump from singular to plural. I, we, we, I. His identity has been absorbed by these demons. The tempest which they had crossed in the sea seems to be dwelling inside this man. The powers are consuming him. 
eating away at his life, absorbing his identity. He's lost his humanity. He's lost his community. He's lost his life. As one writer says, we have renamed the demons of the ancient world, but we have not exorcised them. The man runs to Jesus and he says, What business do you have with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you not to torment me. How about that? These spirits which had made a living tormenting this man begged Jesus not to torment them. Jesus said, What's your name? And the man said, My name is Legion, for we are many. Notice the pronouns there. It's strange. My name is Legion, for we are many. Are many. Now, to the people who first read the Gospel of Mark, this would be the strangest of answers. Legion was a Roman military term. A legion was a Roman grouping of soldiers. For most of the history of the Roman Empire, a Roman legion was something like 5,400 soldiers, which were then divided into subcategories of battalions and that sort of thing. A legion was a Roman military term. This text is saturated by Roman military terms. The word for the pigs, herd. You don't herd pigs. But in Greek, that's a military term. A herd of soldiers, a group of soldiers. This text is saturated with military language. Like the people in this region who tried to bring about healing through force, so did the Roman military. Now, Rome never stood up and said, we're going to come conquer your land and take over everything. That's not how empires work, is it? Rome said, we're coming to bring you peace. We're coming to install the Pax Romana, the fabled peace of Rome. And the peace they spoke about was the peace that comes from subduing your enemies, shackling and chaining your enemies. They offered the sort of healing and peace that comes from force, swords and bombs. Could it be that Mark saw the Roman legions as something of a product of the demonic as well. You see, friends, the demonic and the spiritual realm, spirits are not just ephemeral creatures floating around in the air and, and in the breezes. They're concretized in people and social structures in which we live. It seems that the demons aboard a vacuum, which is why when Jesus began to cast them out of the man, they said, send us into something even the pigs will do. And after Jesus sent them into the pigs, the pigs ran into the sea and drowned. In a story that would have made a Jewish person laugh out loud, the unclean spirits ran into unclean animals and ran into the sea, which in the Jewish mindset was the source of all chaos. I'm assuming this is where deviled ham comes from. I worked really hard on that. I was hoping y'all would like that today. I'm sorry. That was. I had to do something a little extra because y'all drove through a miserable day, and you know. Now the herdsmen ran into town and began to tell everyone what had happened, and the people came out to see what had happened. You don't see this sort of thing every day, and they saw the man who had had the legion of demons sitting there in his right mind, clothed, speaking normally. And when they saw him, they became afraid. I think that's the strangest part of this whole entire story. Did you notice that? When they saw him in his right mind, they became afraid. They had grown accustomed to him in his madness. They had figured out a way to keep him inside their community, yet outside their community. They were comfortable amidst the madness. It was the healing that scared them. Maybe that shouldn't surprise us. We often resist our healing. We become more comfortable struggling with an illness than we do having surgery or doing the hard work of healing. We become more comfortable dancing with our demons than giving ourselves over to the powers that could rid ourselves of them. We become so accustomed to our way of life that when someone crosses the tracks and shows us a different way, it scares our boots off. When they saw him in his right mind, they became afraid. Or, or maybe their fear stemmed from something else. Jesus had just done with His words what they could not do with shackles and chains. Jesus' words carried a power that their power knew not of. 
Maybe what scared them that day was a power they had never beheld before. You stand close enough to a fire and the fire will demand that you take a step back. You stand close enough to a roaring waterfall and the waterfall will demand you take a step back. You stare at the sun long enough and eventually the sun will demand you close your eyes. It reminds me of an old story. A pastor went to visit one of his congregants in the hospital a middle-aged lady who had had an accident many weeks before and the accident had left her paralyzed. And so the pastor went to visit this paralyzed woman in the hospital. They exchanged pleasantries and visited for a while. And the pastor said, well, I best be on my way. Can I pray for you? And the woman said, certainly you can pray for me. And so the pastor bowed his head and began to pray a normal sort of prayer. And he prayed that God would heal this woman lying paralyzed in her hospital bed. After the prayer, he said his goodbye, and suddenly the woman propped herself up in bed. Then she sat up in bed, and then she turned to the side and draped her feet over the side of the bed, and, and then she stood up, and then she walked towards the pastor, and then she jumped up and down, and then she embraced the pastor, I'm healed, I'm healed. And they brought in doctors and nurses, and their jaws hit the ground, and they said, she's healed, we don't understand it. And the pastor went out to his car and he put his key in the ignition. But before he turned on the car, he bowed his head and said to God, Don't you ever do that to me again. (laughs) Maybe that's what it was like that day. Maybe that was it. They had bumped into a presence that astounded them and scared them. Maybe it was something else. Someone owned those 2,000 pigs right? I would imagine that losing 2,000 pigs hit hit someone where it hurts, maybe someone's where it hurts. Someone's initials were branded on those hogs. Someone had invested a lot of capital in those hogs. The bottom line is that those pigs were the bottom line for someone. Now let's be honest. We're all for helping people and we're all for people's lives being changed and we're all for God working in our midst. But when it begins to impact our pocketbooks, well, sometimes we simply care more about 2,000 pigs than we do one human being. In 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe published her famous book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. The book was a poignant argument for the abolishment of slavery and it went a long way to paving the way for the Civil War which would happen in the next couple of decades. Sometime later, Stowe toured England with her husband Calvin who was a biblical scholar and preacher here in America. One day while they were touring in England, England, Calvin preached to a group that had gathered for anti-slavery day in England. This was a group of people who supported the abolishment of slavery. And Calvin Stowe told them that they were hypocrites because they were proud that slavery had long since disappeared in England, but 80% of the cotton which was picked in those days in the South, in the U.S., was bought by England. And he said the slave trade, that slavery would die in America if England would stop buying their cotton from the United States. And Calvin Stowe turned to the the audience that day and he said, and I quote, Are you willing to sacrifice one penny of profits to do away with slavery? Unquote. And history says the crowd booed. They booed him. Maybe it's just that Jesus was bad for the local economy and they couldn't get him out of town fast enough. I don't know. All I know is they asked Jesus to leave and he did. They had figured out a way to live with unclean spirits as long as they stayed in their place. But they just couldn't find a place for Jesus. They were comfortable. They had become comfortable with the forces of death and dehumanization. But they just couldn't stomach the presence of life in their midst. And so they sent him away. But before he left town, he sent the man who had had the legion back to his family, back to his people to share what God had done for him. And so even though Jesus left that side of the tracks... The presence of the kingdom of God did not leave with him. Which leads me to believe that the other side of the tracks would never be the same again. For they had encountered a different kind of way. A way that gave life to people who had grown accustomed to death. 
a way in which one human life was prized more than 2,000 pigs, a way in which people are valued more than prophets, a way in which words do what chains and shackles can never do, what guns and bombs can never do, a way which brings peace not through shackles and chains, not through shackles, not through shackles and chains, the kind of peace that comes from forcing your enemies into ways of peace, but a Jesus kind of peace that comes from welcoming and loving your enemies. A way in which the image of God, which has been distorted in all of our lives to some degree, is recovered. A way which welcomes those who've been banished to cemeteries and institutions. A way which crosses over and through and under and around all tracks, whatever that set of tracks might be. A way in which the status quo is challenged in every way, down to the bedrock, because Jesus' way flies in the face of every other way. A way which reminds us that there is no place in all creation in which the kingdom of God doesn't intend to be manifest. And yet every square inch will be contested along the way. No wonder they ran Jesus off. No wonder they ran Him out of town. There's only one threat to the status quo, one greater threat to the status quo than someone who's lost their mind. There's only one greater threat than someone who's lost their mind. And that's someone who's in their right mind. There's only one greater threat. That day C.W. Scott was driving me around town and he told me about his daddy growing up on the wrong side of the tracks. And he turned to me and he said, Preston, I want us to be the kind of church and the kind of people that don't pay any attention to the tracks. He was in his right mind that day. He was in his right mind. And as an old man, he had followed Jesus long enough to know that all too often being on the right side of Jesus leads us to the wrong side of the tracks. Doesn't it? The right side of Jesus always leads us to the wrong side of the tracks. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we know you as the one who crosses over any and all tracks. Would you give us, as your people, power and energy and wisdom enough to cross a few tracks ourselves? This morning we've confessed to you our efforts to make you fit into our brains. But we hope that somewhere along the way, we allow our brains to fit into your plans and purposes for this world for our lives. Even in these next few moments, O oh Lord, we ponder the tracks in our own lives. We ponder the things that keep us here and them there. We ponder the ways that your kingdom is dying to be born in every nook and cranny. Help us to be willing to pay the price, to be beacons of light and life everywhere we go and over every set of tracks we cross. Help us to be in our right minds, even if that changes the world, even if it changes us. Help us to be in our right mind. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.